Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Let's get some housekeeping taken care of. All right, sign in sheet. Um, so uh, I know it's been a while since we've met, but uh, we're still chugging along. Uh, as for the online lecture, uh, you all saw my email, um, and I, I tried to record an intro uh, at home, but I don't know if it was my microphone or something, but it just seemed like there might have been some audio issues. But the long story short of it was this. I have some pretty nice summary problems on structural design. And I was sitting there thinking, I was like, there's really no point in redoing them. I've got all these recordings. So I just put together a little uh, intro and just said the structural design uh, recordings I had done before, that's actually going to uh, work quite well. Now, I didn't get a, a quiz uploaded, but my plan for the structural, uh, the structural engineering quiz is to actually do that uh, next week. Because what I'm going to do is this. So this week, you all have a mechanics and materials quiz. Then I'm going to give you the structures quiz. Then I'll give you a geotech quiz, because I'm going to do all the geotech questions all at once. So it's just one quiz. Uh, so that way, I'm giving you enough time to do it. It's not too delayed, and uh, all the topics are sort of coalesced together. Sound good? All right, yes? Oh, the ethics was probably the ethics one. Yes. Maybe I'll I'll add a comment or something and say here's the answers. So, yeah. They don't the annotations. They don't really don't do that anymore. So you can't go in and say B. So. So. I will do something about that. Oh, steel design. Okay. So. I was going to uh, say a joke like bad news about steel design for next semester. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have actually a very serious uh, just point about steel design because everybody in here uh, seems to have, uh, or just about everybody has expressed interest in taking it. Um, and it's about the textbook. Okay. So first off, there is no textbook for steel design. Okay. So uh, the, there's the manual. Okay, so give me a second. So, so here, here's what's going to happen with the textbook. So if you go to the bookstore and look up the textbook for steel design, it's going to be blank. There's not going to be anything there. What's going to happen is this. Okay, the steel manual is only available from AISE, the folks who write it. They, you, you know, you can't, they're the only ones who, who, uh, who uh, publish it and, and uh, produce it. Now. The manual by itself, if you just go and buy it, is like 300 some bucks. Uh, that's not going to be your price for it. What's going to happen is this. I, as the professor, go on uh, AISC's page and I make a request for a student discount. And it takes the manual, which is something like $360, and drops it to like $135. Okay? And what happens is I, uh, I get a coupon code that I provide you all. You all go and, and purchase it on your own uh, and get the manual. Okay. Um, you won't really desperately need the manual for the first like couple weeks, so you've got time to get it, okay? But because you pretty much have to have the manual, the way that I get around that is I say, you don't have to buy a book. So there's no textbook for the class. So I'm trying to save you some money. So, But I'm telling you this now because I can see it in December. Where's the textbook, Dr. Mike? There's nothing in the bookstore. This, this is me telling you that. So everybody okay with that? When AISC, whenever they give it to me, I've already requested it. What happens is this: when you request the coupon code, AISC asks for when's the class start or when's the start date for the class. And so the start date for the class is January 14th. So they might not provide it to me until like December or January. As soon as I get it, I'll email blast the class. But there's another point: uh, you probably, if you're planning on taking steel, try and get signed in to the class sooner rather than later so I can get you that coupon code. Don't worry, I'll make it available to everybody on day one if you haven't already gotten it. But, but yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> what color is it? That's, that's good. It's, 
No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find the. <laughs> it's the wrong shade of blue. It's like a turquoise. It's, it's like that. That's that, that. There you go. It kind of looks like that. No, it's not that one. <laughs> it's not that one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But but again, I'm not making you buy a book, and that's yeah. So that that'll make it, make life a lot easier. Does it sound good? Okay, I just wanted to give you all a piece of housekeeping on that. Now, there is going to be a quiz for mechanics and materials. It should be up today. It's going to be due next Wednesday. One of the things I'm adding to this quiz uh, is some conceptual problems, like ones that don't require any math. Um, and I'm probably going to start to add a few of those on the civil engineering related topics. Like, you'll get some uh, soils thing, conceptual problems and whatnot. And I'm going to try and keep it generic as possible uh, so that you all can, can, uh, can you know, uh, get along with those. Like, it, it'll be some pretty basic stuff. Uh, I'm going to try and keep the, the civil reviews pretty basic and pretty fundamental from here on out. Uh, sound good? All right. On to mechanics of materials or mechanics of deformable bodies, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Okay. I don't have many problems for you. In fact, I only have six problems. Um, but these six problems pretty well encapsulate pretty much everything you need uh, for mechanics and materials. Um, there, now, don't get me wrong, it's not everything. So, for instance, I don't have composite bending uh, in, in, this, uh, in this set. But I do have more circle and principal stresses. I have axial loads. I have torsional loads. I have bending and shear. I have a buckling problem. I've got a, a lot of, uh, of that stuff. Now, there's a couple things that I'm not uh, going to, to throw in here. For instance, um, everybody in here had me, did everybody in here have me for 321 for civil materials? Right. Well, for those of you, are, have you all in materials yet discussed like stress strain curves and, and uh, You should, you should have at least mentioned it at, at, at some point. So I, 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 what you need to know for, from that science, at least on this portion of the exam, is, is pretty basic. What I want to do is cover the stuff that is central to Engineering 216, that's fundamental, and that's pretty straightforward. Okay? So I've got six problems that's, that is uh, targeted to address that. We're going to start off with the first one. Okay. So this first problem is an axial load uh, problem, okay? Now, I have a 10 kilogram axial load, and it is, uh, <coughs> it is uniformly carried by an aluminum alloy pipe with an outside diameter of 10 centimeters and an inside diameter of 9.6 centimeters. Now, the pipe is 1.2 meters long. Uh, we have the Young's modulus is 75,000 uh, megapascals. Neglecting the effects of buckling, how much is the pipe compressed? Okay? This is a perfect example of a problem uh, uh, dealing with axial loads. And this covers quite a bit of stuff uh, that, I, that I think you all uh, need to be uh, uh, apprised of. So let me see if I can right here on the screen. We might be able to do a lot of these calcs uh, right here. Okay? So the first thing I, I want to mention right off the bat is units. I would argue that, that mechanics and materials is probably one of the sections on the FE where units can get you more than anything. And so my advice to you is this. Right off the bat, convert everything into a consistent unit system. And by consistent unit system, I mean pick a force unit and pick a length unit and keep it consistent. So what I'm going to do for this problem uh, is this. I'm going to say that forces are in newtons and lengths are in meters. Okay, so therefore stress is in newtons per meter squared and what's another name for that? 
That's a Pascal, okay? Now, <clears throat> the reason why I throw that out there is because another shorthand, which we're going to see later, is if you have a kilonewton and a millimeter squared, that's a gigapascal. So just, just keep that in mind. Okay. All right. Let's write down some of these, uh, these fundamental values. So let's start off with some basics. Okay. The length of this pipe is 1.2 meters. Okay. Right off the bat, are the units consistent? Well, what's that? No, for this, for this value, for length. Yeah. All right. Now, what about E? Okay. First off, y'all remember that Young's modulus is represented by E, right? Your slope or your your uh, your elastic region. So that is seventy-five thousand megapascals. Is that consistent? No. Okay. The easiest way of dealing with that is recognizing that mega uh, is just shorthand for times. 10 to the what? Somebody, I heard it. 6. There you go. So this is 75,000 times 10 to the 6 pascals. Okay? And E values are huge. So don't get freaked out if your Young's modulus is really big. Okay? That, that's fine. All right? Now, what about your axial load? Okay? Now, let's keep in mind what's going on. We're taking this aluminum pipe and we're pressing on it. I mean, think, sort of conceptualize in your head what's going on. A 10 kilogram axial load is uniformly carried by an aluminum pipe. So you've got this pipe and you have a 10 kilogram load on that pipe. All right. So if the 10 kilograms represents the mass, how do I determine the force on that pipe? Multiply by gravity. So, uh, so our axial load is 10 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared. So that's 98.1, and what are the units there? Newtons. Is that a consistent unit system? Yeah, because we have our forces in newtons and our uh, uh, lengths in meters, everything's fine there. Now, <clears throat> In order to determine stress, let's just go back to basic stress, okay? Um, I mean, what is a basic definition of stress? It's force per unit what? Area, right? It's like it's, stress is basically like pressure, okay? The only difference is pressure is a term related to fluids. Stress is a term related to solids, okay? So what we need is the cross-sectional area of this pipe, okay? So remember, samurai sword or lightsaber, we cut through the pipe. What do we see? Okay, let's read the uh, let's read the description. We have a, a, a pipe that has an outside diameter of 10 centimeters and an inside diameter of 9.6 centimeters. So that looks probably something like this. I'll do the best I can. That's the best I got. Okay, so this distance is. 10 centimeters or what? 0 0.1 meters. And this distance right here is 9.6 centimeters or 0 0.096 meters. Everybody read that. Is that okay? Okay. And so when we're talking about area, you know, cutting a section, looking at the pipe, Really what we're trying to determine is the area of this shaded region right here. That's, that's what we're trying to determine. That's the area. Because think, the bigger that shaded area is, the lower our stress. You know, more material, less stress. Okay? Now, does anybody know how to determine that area? Like, how would I compute the area of that shaded region? Exactly right. So we take the area of the outer circle minus the area of the inner circle. Now, with, uh, in terms of diameters, how do you find the area of a circle? Pi d squared divided by 4. There we go. So I propose that to compute that area, we take pi over 4, and I'm going to say d outer squared minus d inner squared. 
Is everybody okay with that? That's not bad, right? So pi over 4, so 0 0.1 meters squared minus 0 0.096 meters squared. And so what does that come out to be? It'll be a really tiny value because we're representing the, think about what are the units going to be for this area? Square meters, right? And we're talking about the area of a pipe that's about this big. So it's going to be a really tiny number, and that's okay. 0.000616. So how about this? In, in scientific notation, would you say 6.16 times 10 to the minus 4? And that's meters squared. Is everybody okay with that? And I got seconds on that? Okay. Now let's, let's sort of take a, a step off this and let's go to the handbook. We can't call? No, we ain't doing that because, yeah. Okay. Now, open the handbook and you'll have the section for mechanics of materials. And so a lot of this should be fairly familiar. So we have the uh, stress-strain curve for mild steel. We have some pretty basic definitions for what is strain, what is stress, uh, so on and so forth. Now, what I want to do is I want to focus on this right here, okay? So this is uniaxial loading and deformation. So this is taking a member and either yanking on an intention or applying compression to it. Okay? And so let, let's take a look at what we've determined so far. Um, we've determined P, right? That's the loading, right? So that was like 98 newtons uh, of force being uh, applied uniaxially to this pipe. We know the cross-sectional area. So if we wanted, we could determine the stress. We could take 98 and divide it by the area and get a stress in pascals, right? That's fine. Uh, we uh, also know the length of this member. Uh, and we know Young's modulus. We know E, OK? Well, let's, let's take a look at what the problem is asking for, OK? The problem is asking for neglecting the effects of the buckling, how much is the pipe compressed, OK? Let's think about that. Remember, you have an element, you apply load, it deforms. That's central, you know, fundamental you know, mechanics of, of deformable bodies. So here, imagine that this is the pipe. Here's the pipe here, and I'm taking this, and I'm applying a compressive load. Really, what I'm after is this, delta, the longitudinal deformation, how much uh, it squishes or how much it stretches. Okay? And so to compute that, I take PL over AE. So going back to my slide, uh, so therefore, oh, delta equals PL over AE. So we have 98.1 newtons. We have 1.2 meters. We have 75,000 times 10 to the 6 pascals. We have 6.16 times 10 to the minus 4 meters squared. Now, keep in mind, all of our units are consistent, okay? Everything's in newtons and meters. This is pascal, newtons per meter squared. That's meters squared. So if I'm computing a deflection, what, whatever this number is, what are the units going to be? Meters, okay? Now let's see if we have a value. Now it's going to be tiny, and that's okay. Deflections tend to be rather tiny. Now remember, it's in meters. Like we're asking how much does this pipe deform in meters. It's going to be really small, so that's okay. Yeah, whatever the value is in meters. It, it'll, so go ahead. 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. Okay? Now, that's the answer, but we have to express it in a unit system that makes sense. Okay? 
Every one of our units uh, for our answers are in millimeters, okay? So I propose that we need to convert this to millimeters. Anybody know how to convert that to millimeters? It would be 2.5 times 10 to the negative 3, right? Because remember, an M, a little m, is a 10 times minus 3, okay? So how do I express that number in 10, uh, 10 to the minus 3? So it would be like 1, 2, 3. So it would be 0 0.00256 or something millimeters. And there we go. Was it was it two five or two six? What was it? Two five five. So two five five rounded up two five six. Yeah. All right. Let's take a second. What do you think? Any questions on that one? It's not too bad, right? This is pretty much, in a nutshell axial loads. And axial loads is a big component of mechanics of deformable bodies, okay? Let's also be clear, with these values we can compute quite a bit, okay? I want to, before we move on to the next problem, I really want to, want to talk about this, okay? I have P and I have A so I could determine stress, okay? I now have deflection and the original length so I could determine strain, okay? Pop quiz, what are the units for strain? There are no units for strain, exactly right, they're unitless because it's meters per meter or inches per inches, so there are no units, okay? You might see like inches per inch or millimeters per millimeters, but mathematically there are no units for strain, okay? We could also, let's go back to that stress, okay? Somebody tell me, what is the stress here? If I took P divided by A, just somebody, somebody give me a value. You have Casio FX115 ES pluses in front of you. just so we can have something to, to discuss. 160,000 Pascals? Is, that, is everybody else getting that? So 160,000 Pascals, we could compare 160,000 Pascals against an allowable stress. Let's say the allowable stress is 200,000 Pascals. Then that would determine whether or not the design is safe. Okay? We could also take those two and divide them to determine a factor of safety. All right? We can take 200,000 divided by 160 and get a factor of safety of 1.344, whatever it is. Um, does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right, so I, I know that this problem seems pretty straightforward, but I want you to think about all that you can do with this and where you can go with it, okay? Sound good? All right, now, our next problem involves something being twisted. Okay? Now, a couple things about recapturing uh, some mechanics and materials. So the equation that we just looked at was delta equals PL over EA. Okay? And that was for axial loads, and that was to determine the total amount of stretch or, or squish, if you will, uh, of a member subjected to an axial load. Well, for torsion, our fundamental expression for torsion is the angle of twist is determined by TL over GJ. Okay? Now, there are some very striking similarities between these two, two expressions, which is why uh, uh, usually when you teach mechanics of deformable bodies, you teach axial loads and torsion right next to one another because they go together quite well. For instance, take a look at these two formulas. You're both solving for a deformation. In the case of axial loads, you're solving for an axial stretch or, or, or shrink or whatnot. For uh, torsion, you're determining an angle of twist. Okay, now how do you determine that? Well, with both expressions, you take the applied demand, either P or T, you multiply it by the member length, and you divide it by what? You divide it by a material property, either E or J, and then you multiply that by a section property, either A or the polar moment of inertia J. Okay? 
So these are all very synonymous formulas and they go together quite well. Okay? So that's my first point. My second point is this. Okay? If you are ever on the FE and you are dealing with a problem that is with torsion, where something's being twisted, if it is a non-circular cross-section, something's wrong. Okay? Right? In other words, um, anytime you're dealing with a torsional problem on the FE, it should be a circular cross-section, either a solid circular shaft or a pipe. Okay? This particular problem is a pipe. Okay? There's a very specific reason for that. In mechanics and in mechanical design, we traditionally limit torsional uh, uh, designs to, to sections that are circular because non-circular cross-sections tend to warp. They deform in and out of the plane. It's just the way that, that uh, uh, physics behaves with respect to torsion. So why do we only use circular sections for torsion? Because non-circular sections warp. So in case you get asked that on the exam, it gets brought up. So. Okay. That, that's all I have. Okay. Everybody okay with this? All right. Now, we're going to do the same thing that we did before. We're going to... Uh, uh, select a consistent unit system and we're going to employ that throughout. Okay, So I have, I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm going to say that force is in newtons and length is in meters. So therefore stress is in pascals. Okay. Now, what do we know from this problem? Okay, we have a steel pipe that's fixed in one end and it's subjected to a torque of 100,000 newton meters. So basically, imagine you have a pipe in this hand and you're twisting it. It's kind of like, a, a, like if you're, you're wringing a towel. Like really, I mean, how, how does that work? You have a, a towel and you're trying to wring it. Like you could hold your hand here and twist this, but really what you're doing is twisting in equal and opposite directions, right? So the total amount of torque or torsion on this section is 100,000 newton meters. Okay? The length of this pipe is 3 meters. Okay? So we're already halfway there. Okay? Let me go to the, the, the manual because I want to make sure everybody's following along from a manual standpoint. So here's the uh, here's the, the manual. We have uniaxial loading, we have shear stress, so, so on and so forth, uh, stress and strain, da 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 da, torsion, ah, torsional strain, here we go. All right, total angle of twist, and you can see here, TL over GJ. So, everybody okay with that? Now, oh, okay. Now, in order to determine the total angle of twist of the pipe, we're going to need two more quantities. We're going to need G, which is our shear modulus, and we're going to need J, which is our polar moment of inertia. Let's handle G first. Okay? Now, G is a shear modulus. It's a material parameter. Okay? It's, it's, it's like Young's modulus or the yield stress. It's a material-related parameter. Do we know what that value is? Was it given to us? What's, well, we know it's steel, but what values were given to us? What numbers? Well, let's see. So, say it again. But but what is that though? That's the modulus of elasticity. That's Young's modulus. Okay. What what I'm getting at is this. Okay. What I'm getting at is we know that E is 210 gigapascals, and we know that Poisson's ratio is 0.3. Y'all remember what Poisson's ratio is? Exactly. Think, think of the easiest way, I know it's a little gross, but think about chewing gum. You know, if you take a piece of chewing gum and you stretch it, what happens? It gets longer, but it also gets thinner, right? Okay. Poisson's ratio is the ratio of that lateral strain to that longitudinal strain. For steel, a value of 0.3 is pretty common. Um, now, this is your Young's modulus E, and this is your Poisson's ratio, but this doesn't tell us what the shear modulus is. Those of you who have your 
manuals in front of you, can you tell me what the expression is? What is the formula for G? It's in there. There we go. Where, where, what page did you find that on? 85. Is everybody else able to find that? Any questions? All right. So this is 210 gigapascals divided by 2 times 1 plus 0 0.3. What does that come out to be? Excuse me. Oh, I wasn't writing on the slide. Whoops. I'm writing just sort of like on the screen. I'm going to convert that here in a second. You're, you're exactly right. So this was E is 210 gigapascals and nu is 0 0.3. Does anybody have a value for that? 80.77. And what are the units for that? Gigapascals. Is that a consistent unit system? No, because we need it in pascals. So I'm going to say 80.77 times 10 to the ninth pascals. Great question. Question was, what formula are we using where we even need to use this crazy value G? And the answer is, if you go to page 80, uh, 87, right here, if you look at torsional strain, there should be a section here called torsional strain. Okay, What we are trying to determine is the total angle of twist, which is TL over GJ, which, by the way, the only time that you would need to integrate this, see if you notice how it's expressed in an integral form, uh, uh, fashion, the only time you ever actually need to integrate is in one of two uh, 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 scenarios. Either A, the torque is unconstant, in other words, if the torque varies along the shaft, or if J varies along the shaft. And that's just a fancy way of saying what if the shaft gets bigger or smaller along its length. Like if Here's the shaft, and then it gets smaller. Like, that's when you would have to integrate. But since it's all constant, we don't need to worry about it. And we're just using TL over GJ. All right? Everybody okay with this? Now, we do need a polar moment of inertia, a J value. So I'm curious to see if anybody can find the J value for a circle in this book. And it might not be in the mechanics of materials section. It stands for the polar moment of inertia. I'll give you a clue. It's in the statics section. Which, by the way, are we dealing with a solid circular shaft for this problem or a pipe for this problem? Pipe. Okay. That's for, a, that's for a solid shaft. For a pipe, it... This right here. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh. He stole his thunder, man. You owe him an apology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me go back here. OK, so our J value is uh, pi over 2 times a to the fourth minus b to the fourth. Now the A values on that expression, are they diameters or radii? Radii, OK? Now, what I'm going to do is go ahead and convert those right now. So help me out. 
We have the pipe. It has an outside diameter of 35 centimeters and a wall thickness of one centimeter. Okay, so help me out with this. Let's see what we got. Here's our pipe. This is one centimeter, and this is 35 centimeters. So can somebody tell me, we'll just leave it in centimeters for now, what is A? Exactly, it's half that, or, well, you're talking about in meters, so, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. So I'm gonna say it's 17.5, centimeters or 0 0.175 meters. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, and again that's just from the center to the outside. So if that's A, what is B? Once, well, no, no, no. Think. From here to here, there you go, there you go. So, so from there to there is A, from here to here is B, so that's A, this is B, this is 16.5 centimeters or 0 0.165 meters. So therefore, J pi over 2, A to the fourth minus B to the fourth, which is pi over 2 times that minus that, which is what? By the way, I highly recommend that you convert forces and distances, particular distances, before you square them. Like, convert centimeters. Don't convert centimeters to the fourth, because, yeah. 3.89? Oh, 089. Okay. Times 10 to the minus fourth, and that is what? What was the units? Meters to the fourth. Okay. All right. Now, I'm running out of a little bit of room here on the slide, but I've got a nice spot of room up here up top. So I'm going to do this up here. So therefore, phi is TL over GJ, which is, so the torque is 100,000 Newton meters. L is 3 meters. G is... 80.77 times 10 to the ninth pascals and J 3.089 times 10 to the fourth meters to the fourth. I don't know why the pen's getting all curly and weird up there, but, but it is. Now, if you follow the units for this computation, up top we have Newton meters times meters. So we have Newtons times meters squared. That's on the top. On the bottom, you have Newtons over meters squared. That's the Pascal times the meters to the fourth. Chug it out and you'll find all your units cancel. Okay? Now you're computing an angle. How do you, how do you express an angle with no units? It is expressed in radians. Okay? So when you compute this out, what do you get? And that's radians. What do you think? Are there any questions on this? Okay, again, I want to say the same thing before uh, that I did related to axial loads. We have the T 
We have the L, we have the G, we have the J, we have the angle of twist. There's a lot of things that we can compute right now. Okay? If you take TR over J, you can compute the shear stress. We could then compare that against an allowable to see what our factor of safety is. We could take this and determine the angle of twist, or the, 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 not the angle of twist, but the, uh, the shear strain. Okay? Shear strain, if we take that uh, rotation and divide it by the length, that'll be the shear strain, gamma. Uh, it's like change in length over the original length, change in angle over the original length is the shear strain. Okay? Um, everybody okay with this? I know you've at least seen this before. I know you have. Am I going to have to twist your arm to get an answer? Twi oh, my goodness. Now, I hit, I hit the button. There we go. Okay. So far, so good? Okay. We have a beam that has a triangular cross-section as shown. Okay. What is the maximum compressive stress in the beam? Okay. This is a very fundamental question uh, that you would get on the FE, and it's basically testing the most fundamental stress formula that you'll uh, use, which is sigma equals my over i, the bending stress uh, function uh, for beams. Uh, now, we, we, whether or not you, it's been a while since you've done this in mechanics, we did this in concrete design. We used sigma equals my over i quite a bit when we were doing elastic uh, bending stresses in the beginning. So I know, I know you've seen this before. Uh, and fortunately, we have a, a situation where the, um, the beam is pretty straightforward. Now, hopefully you all don't need to look into the manual. I have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load. What is the formula for the maximum bending moment on that beam? Nope. Over 8. Remember, over 2 is for a cantilever. For uh, WL squared over 8 for a simply supported beam. And again, if you didn't remember, it's in the manual. I did trick you on the test, didn't I? Well, that wasn't the trick. It was if you put the rebar in the bottom of the beam. Okay, so I think we're back. Now the pen's being weird. Okay, the pen works there. I don't know what happened, but looks like we're going to have to screen clip this a bit. All right. Okay, so here's our problem. We need to determine the maximum bending stress in this beam. So we'll say 3. So first off, we need the maximum bending moment, which is WL squared over 8. So that's 80 Newton meters times 10 meters squared over 8. So our bending moment is what? Say it again. A thousand Newton meters. Yep, there we go. Okay. Now, if you all remember fundamental bending theory, okay, there is zero bending stress or strain at the centroid, right? And then f further away from the centroid, you get, you know, you know, more bending stress. Remember, it's zero. Uh, at the neutral axis, and then like the top is experiencing compression, the bottom is experiencing tension. Y'all remember that? Okay, so here's our cross section. Uh, 
Where is our centroid? This is a triangle. Where's our centroid? One third of the way up, right? Okay. So this dimension here, that's 2h over 3. This dimension is h over 3, right? And what does the bending stress profile look like? Well, this is compression goes to zero, and that's that, right? Everybody remember that? So what we need to determine is sigma equals my over i. We know m, what about our y? Well, our y is going to be 2h over 3, all right? So y, oh. so y equals 2h over 3. The, we have two questions we have to answer. Okay, first off, what is H and what is I? Okay, well, here's our triangle. Okay, here's our triangle. It looks, let's see, let, let's take a look at it. It looks like this. All right. This dimension is 12 centimeters, and each of these are 10 centimeters. I'll convert the units here in a second. All right, let me ask you this. If I do this, right, where that's a right angle and that's a right angle, how long is that and that? Six. So this is six centimeters, this is six centimeters. Now if this is six centimeters and that's ten centimeters, anybody know what that is? Eight centimeters. Now how'd you get that? The three, four, five, right? Three, four, five, six, eight, ten. So the height is eight centimeters. Therefore, y is two-thirds eight centimeters, which is what? It's like 5.33 centimeters or uh, was it 0 0.0533 meters, right? Which actually, what's that? Why? Okay, uh, hold on for one second. Let me see something. Okay, so y is the distance from the centroid either to the very, 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 very top or the very, 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 very bottom, okay? Now, why are we going to the top? That's a great question, all right? Here's the beam. Would you agree that the beam is going to bend something like that, right? So the top of the beam is going to experience compression. Would you agree with that? Okay. The problem is asking for what is the largest compressive stress in the beam. So how far is it for, oh, how far is it from the centroid to the very, very, very tippy tippy top? Well, if it's a triangle, it's not one third of the height, it's two thirds of the height. Is everybody okay with that? Th that's a good question. Everybody good? Okay. Now the last thing that's remaining is the moment of inertia, okay? Now we have a triangle that has a base of 12 centimeters and a height of 8 centimeters. Does anybody know what the moment of inertia of a triangle is with a base of 12 and a height of 8? Keep in mind, we ought to convert these to 0 0.12 meters and 0 0.08 meters. Now that's for a rectangle. You've got, you've got, you should have your laptops and your NCEES FE exam reference manual in front of you. You're like, he, he's going to be sleep deprived. You know, he's not going to remember this stuff. I'm not that. <laughs> I'm not that sleepy. 
BH cubed over 36, what page are you on? 74. Here we go. Here's our triangle. B wide, H tall, moment of inertia, BH cubed over 36. So, hopefully you all have your reference manuals and you're, and you're following along with that. So, therefore, man, I'm, I'm drawing all over the place. I apologize for that. I is BH cubed over 36, which is 0 0.12 meters, 0 0.08 meters to the third, divided by 36, and that's what? One point seven times ten to the minus six, and that's meters to the fourth. So therefore, sigma equals m y over i. So that is a thousand newton meters. That is zero point zero five three three meters. That is one point seven times 10 to the minus 6 meters to the fourth. What does that come out to be? 1. What are the units if it's a stress? Newtons and meters squared is going to be a Pascal. And it's going to be a big number. Pascal. And so if I wanted to express that in, let's say, mega Pascal, well, a mega is times 10 to the 6. So that's 31 mega Pascal. What do we think? Not too bad, right? This stuff really isn't that complicated, I promise. What if it was rotating? Like, what if that would be like the tail? The tail you mean like if the 12 was up top and... That's a good question. Um, I, I'd say, this is what I would say. That probably wouldn't happen on the exam because it sounds to me what you're talking about is a section that is unsymmetric. Non-symmetric bending is, it's not out there, it's just the formula gets a little more intense because you need uh, a moment of inertia in the x direction, you need a moment of inertia in the y direction, and you need a product moment of inertia. And that's a lot for a three-minute problem. I'm not saying that it couldn't happen, but probably not. Even I might say, just guess C and move on. So, everybody okay with this? All right. Um, okay. Let's move on to this one. I'm going to try something. I'm going to try and close the PowerPoint and reopen it and see if that fixes the pen because it's not wanting to write on the pen. Give me one second. I apologize. Taking extra time? Yeah, but if we can get this done earlier, I'd like to be considered. Get it done earlier. I'm a nice guy sometimes. There is that. Hold on, let's. All right. Never mind. I tried. Here, here's what we'll do. Here's what we'll do. This is what we'll do. We'll, we're going to make it work. We will make this work. There we go. We'll make it happen. 
All right, so I have a rectangular beam that is four centimeters wide, that's six centimeters high, that is subjected to a shear of 7,000 newtons at a particular location. The beam is constructed of 2014-T3 aluminum, what is most nearly the maximum shear stress, okay? First off, before we even begin this problem, um, we have uh, a load, okay? We have a load of four uh, of 7,000 newtons, and we are to take that load and determine a stress, okay? What material that beam's made out of doesn't matter, okay? So that 2014 T3 aluminum is just there to throw you, okay? The only time that the material parameters matter is if you are trying to relate applied load to resulting deformation. If the problem was saying, how much does it deform, then you need to know material parameters. But if all you're trying to determine is stress, doesn't matter, okay? Now, what we have here is a transverse shear stress, okay? Now, first off, we know that V in this case is 7,000 newtons, okay? Now, can somebody tell me, is there a formula in the manual for transverse shear? Because what we're talking about is a beam doing that. Is there a stress formula for transverse shear? There is. I'm, I'm positive of it. Say it again. VQ over IB. Um, what happened there? I'm not having a good technological day. All right. So here's our here's our fundamental uh, shear stress formula: VQ over IB. Okay. Now, what is B? The width or the beam. So that's going to be four centimeters, 0 0.04 meters, okay? What is I? I is the moment of inertia, okay? So we have H is six centimeters, which is 0 0.06 meters. Therefore, the moment of inertia is BH cubed over what? 12, there we go. So 0 0.04 times 0 0.06 over 12 is what? Well, actually, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't even need to worry about that. I apologize. All the stresses are in newtons and centimeters squared, so we don't need to convert this to meters at all. Well, you just have to convert back at the end. I'm sorry. I really am. My heart is breaking. I'm not setting a good example, am I? She's not even two weeks old. What do we have here for this? What's the moment of inertia? 72, you said? Centimeters to the fourth, okay? The only one that requires a little bit of explanation is Q. Q is the first moment of area, okay? So here's my wooden beam, right? So this is, or wooden, it's aluminum centimeters, this is six centimeters, okay? If I was trying to determine the shear stress, let's say, well, hold on, let me, let me, let me, let's, let me put the centroid. So that's the centroid. If I was trying to determine the shear stress, let's say, right here, okay, at a particular line, it would be this area times however far that was from the centroid. And that would tell us what the shear stress is right here, 
Oh my goodness. All right. But what we're trying to determine is the maximum shear stress. And I think you can pretty much see the lower this point goes, the larger this area becomes. So really, the maximum shear stress in a uh, rectangular beam is right in the middle. So what we're really trying to determine is this. We're trying to determine Q for this right here. So help me out. What is the area of that blue box? There we go. And what is that distance from the centroid of the whole beam to the centroid of that block? One and a half centimeters. Therefore, Q is a y, which is 18 cubic centimeters. Everybody okay with that? That's what the first moment of area is, area times a moment arm from the centroid. Pretty straightforward. So therefore, tau equals VQ over IB, so that is 7,000 newtons times 18 cubic centimeters over 72 centimeters to the fourth and four centimeters. What does that come out to be? Excuse me. And that is newtons per centimeter squared, most nearly 440. So far, so good? Any questions on this one? Okay, two more, and this next one's really quick. Actually, they're both pretty quick. Okay. So, given the following uh, state of stress, what is most nearly the maximum shear stress? So, this is later on in mechanics and materials when you've determined, okay, here's how I determine bending stresses, here's how I determine shear stresses, here's how I determine torsional stresses, and so on and so forth. Now, what do I do when I've got a, uh, an element subjected to multiple stresses? I need to determine worst case scenarios, okay? Moore's circle will tell you two things. It will tell you your maximum principal stresses, and it will tell you your maximum shear stress. If you remember, if you draw out more circle, so here's our normal stress, here's our shear stress. Everybody's laughing. I'm, we're going to bring this back. Oh, God. That's actually not bad. I'm not going to do better. Okay. When you plot out more circle, this is going to tell you your worst. These are your principal stresses. And then the radius of that circle, or this distance, is your maximum shear stress. Okay. Now. You don't need to remember all of that because you have the manual, okay? So, what? Christ, <laughs> looking at me like, I'm getting these weird, weird, oh, no. I want fit one full page. Okay. 
mechanics of materials. Here we go. So, more circle. Here's more circle. We have our principal stresses. Here's the center of that circle. Here's the radius of that circle. And the radius of that circle will tell us the maximum shear stress. So it's very plug and chuck. The radius of your circle is sigma x, or we take sigma x minus sigma y. Average those, square it, plus tau xy squared, square root of the whole thing. So that is what we have, minus 140, minus 205, over 2 squared, plus 100 squared. Nice thing about more circle problems, everything's usually in consistent units and your answer comes out in consistent units. Like everything's in megapascals and the answer's in megapascals. So what do we get? Okay. Whenever you plot more circle, you need two things. You need the center and the radius. The radius is always your maximum shear stress, and then the center plus your radius or the center minus your radius are your principal stresses. Yes? It does, well, here. Let's see, let me go right here. This is your expression for principal stresses, okay? It is this quantity plus or minus a certain value. And when you plot this out, this is the center along the x-axis, and this is the radius, okay? So if you take sigma x plus sigma y over 2, that is where this point is. So this point minus your radius, this point plus your radius is that, okay? Everybody okay with this? Now, I gotta, I got, I gotta pull something up real quick. Because I'm gonna, everybody's gonna understand this. I, I promise. It's it's one of those things where people like they get an engineering degree. I still never understood more circle. I still don't get it. Um, Okay. Okay. All right. Now, what are the three moves, right? Got the karate chop, got the judy chop, you got the ninja chop, right? Don't go karate chopping while you're kung fu kicking. Because you go like that, there goes your leg. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, hey, 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 we'll get, we'll, we will show it at the end. Okay. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So let me explain what's happening here because I'm going to explain more circle, I promise. Okay. Up until now when we've been cutting sections using the samurai sword or lightsaber, we've been cutting like this. Okay. Because Generally, that's what makes the most sense, okay? But what I want to do is introduce the concept, well, what if we cut it at an angle, okay? When you cut a section at an angle, you can get, you know, different stress components. You could get a component in the x direction, component in the y direction, shear stress, what have you, okay? What more circle does is it tells you what are the resulting stresses if you cut at different angles, okay? This is an animation showing, okay, if I have a stress state, let's say this is my X stress, this is my Y stress, and this is my shear stress. If you rotate, as you rotate the cut, the, the, the angle of your, your, your ninja chop, what happens is the stresses change, okay? 
because you're cutting at a different section. So it's like going from, from one coordinate system to another. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is focus on this line and this line. Okay. Those lines represent the shear stress. They're equal and opposite uh, on, those, uh, on those faces. Okay. What happens is as you hit right there, whoa, as you hit right there, what happens is the shear stress goes to zero and you hit your maximum normal stresses. That's the tail ends of your, of your Mohr circle. Okay? That's, that's this. Okay? Minimum shear stress because the shear stress is zero and you're getting as far out on the normal stress as you can. Whereas on the other end, there is a point where there is a point where the normal stresses minimize and you get maximum shear stress. Probably somewhere about right here. Okay? And so that's all Moore Circle is telling you is what are the stress states from one point to another. That's that's it. That's what Moore Circle is. That's it. It's just a graphical technique to make uh, the computation of those stresses a lot easier. That's it. We'll, we'll get to that. We'll All right. Okay. All right, all right. All right. It's our last problem. It's our last problem. So, this problem is the final topic in mechanics of materials, traditionally uh, in the course and on the exam, and that's the concept of buckling. Okay. So, what we have here is we have a rectangular steel bar that's uh, with with associated dimensions, and it's subjected to axial compression. Okay. Now the bar has a length of 1.75 meters, it has a modulus of elasticity as follows, what's the critical buckling load? Okay, so we're going to compute a couple values right off the bat. However, I'm going to introduce a, a different consistent unit system. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say that my force is going to be in kilonewtons and my lengths need to be in millimeters. The reason why is because my resulting stress, if you take a kilonewton and divide it by a millimeter squared, you get a gigapascal. Okay? Just follow the units and, and, and you will see. Okay? So the reason why I'm throwing that out there is we have a member length that was given to us as 1.75 meters. Instead of leaving it in meters, I'm actually going to convert that to 1,750 millimeters. Okay. Now we have an E value of 200 gigapascals, and we have the following um, uh, member dimensions. Okay. Now we are going to need a moment of inertia. Okay. Now we're going to need a moment of inertia, and the formula is BH cubed over 12. Okay? Now, here's, I want you to, to pay attention to what I'm doing here because this is not a mistake. All right? I'm going to say 50 millimeters times 37.5 millimeters cubed. Now, that might not seem right because it might seem like I've got these numbers backwards. I actually don't. Okay? When you're calculating buckling lows, you're trying to determine the worst case scenario. If I have the yardstick in my hand and I apply load and compression, it's going to buckle whichever way it's going to buckle. And tr typically, it's going to buckle about its weak axis. Okay? Now, for those of you taking steel design next week, we're going to talk about strong axis, weak axis in very significant detail in there because that's going to be a, a thing when we talk about columns. But for now, in, in this uh, uh, segment, 
we're basically saying that this is going to buckle about its weak axis. So instead of it being 37.5 times 50 cubed over 12, I'm flipping them. And the reason why I'm flipping them, this is going to result in a lower moment of inertia and resulting a, a weaker section. Okay. Now if I compute this out, what do I get? What, what's that? Two po like 2 point, like 2.197, something like that, times 10 to the fifth, and that's millimeters to the fourth. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Now, what we're determining in this problem is a critical buckling load. Okay? Now, if I go to, you know, trusty FE reference manual, here we go. Critical buckling load. All right, so pi squared EI over KL squared. Now K is our effective length factor, okay? When we derive, in mechanics and materials, when you derive the fundamental expression for column buckling, you always derive it based off of the, based off a pin-pin column, okay? So if you're ever dealing with a pin-pin column, your K value is one. What you then do is adjust that expression. So what if you have a fixed fixed column or a fixed free column or a pin fixed column? You adjust this expression by using a different K value. Now for our purposes, we have a problem that is pin pinned, okay? Because uh, it says right here, pinned at each end. So because we have a column that's pinned at each end, our K value is one and our KL is 1750 millimeters. But if you had a column that was fixed at one end and pinned at the other, or fixed at one end and free at, the, uh, free at the other, you would just use a different K value. Okay? So therefore, our critical buckling load is pi squared EI divided by KL squared so pi squared times 200 gigapascals One forty one point six, and that's going to be sorry in kilonewtons. What do you think? Now it's only six problems, but that was mechanics of deformable bodies in a nutshell. It was a very fast review of engineering two sixteen. Very fast. Oh, goodness. All right. Oh. You know what? What the heck? No, I don't. <laughs> or, no, is it, is it West Virginia Ninja? This right here. <laughs> All right. So if you're wondering where that came from, this how old is this? You're now a proud owner of one diamond. Hold on. What the heck? We'll just have fun with it.
Dynamics too. So now, now you've been oriented. So keep in mind that there was there was dynamics and ethics in that review as, as well, you know. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, those random folks in the public who like see this review, they're gonna, they're going to go, "What is he doing?" <laughs> 